uh, residing in California, the state of California will recognize those foreign marriages. Great. Okay. Now, by the way, folks, we're, we're laying groundwork, so uh, bear with us a little bit as we uh, go through this. Uh, so the next question is, what is the significance of the single economic unit concept for married couples and the 1930 Supreme Court decision, Poe versus Seaborn? Well, a lot of people think that a mar the marriage unit is a single economic unit, that has always been a single economic unit. The interesting thing is, for tax purposes, it has not been. When we enacted the modern income tax in 1913, uh, the concept was individual taxation. So a husband was one individual taxpayer and the wife was a separate individual taxpayer. Now in truth, most married women did not have income in those days. Right. Um, but it was possible. And certainly under California law, which is a community property state, yeah. as well as Oregon and the and, and, and Washington. Washington, sorry, not Oregon, yes. Washington, uh, and the other community property states, Wives, in effect, did own 50% of all of the income that was earned by the husband or was earned on the community property. Uh, because of progressive rates, you would pay a much lower income tax if you could split the couple's income into 50% reported by the husband and 50% reported by the wife. In effect, you're taking uh, income from the unit that would yes. be taxed at the highest bracket and you're moving it over and being taxed at the low bracket, the starting bracket. Uh, of, of a separate taxpayer. Uh, and so couples in community property states began to take the position that the husband should only report 50% of the income and the wife should only report 50% of the income. There was a fight back and forth with the, with the, the, the Justice Department uh, and the Treasury on this. And finally, they actually decided this is the tax authorities and the taxpayers, uh, taxpayers' representatives, decided they would file a test case for every state that was a community property state and they would let the courts decide whether or not married couples in community property states could split income. The first case to hit the Supreme Court was Poe versus Seaborn. It was a, uh, a Washington community property uh, state case and the court ruled that uh, because community property law vests the income in each of the spouses the moment it comes into existence, it is always owned 50% by husband and 50% by wife. As a result, yes, they can split all earned income and all uh, community property income on their tax returns. Yes. Well, you can imagine what an upheaval this was for, for, for taxpayers in New York and Florida and places that weren't community property states. It meant that they were paying higher income taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed unequal, but it was just the problem of the different property regimes in the states. Now, just to sort of regroup a little bit, at this time, people were filing separate income tax returns, the husbands and wives. Right. They didn't there have was joint. no joint return at that yeah. time. Yeah. Well, you could file jointly, but you simply filed a single return and aggregated your income on it. It was still just one single tax rate. Okay. Okay, so there, was, there were no joint returns. The couples in community property states were paying lower taxes, and Congress was struggling with this. Okay. Poe versus Seaborn came down in 1930. It took them until 1948, that is, it took Congress until 1948 to solve the problem, and they solved the problem by enacting the joint return. Yes. So the joint return essentially allowed husbands and wives in New York and other states to split their income and pay exactly the same as husbands and wives in community property states. As and that's been the state of the law. Since as long then. as they filed joint returns. So if they yeah. filed separate returns. Well, if they, they filed separate, separate they yeah. don't get to file yeah. as a single taxpayer. There yeah. is a special rate yeah. table, as you know, for married filing separately. Uh, and usually there's not much advantage to doing that. So most okay. couples do file jointly. Okay. But Poe versus Seaborn has never been overruled. It is still good law. So if a married couple in California did file separately, mm -hmm. they would still report 50% of the community income, right. half by the husband, half by right, the wife. Right, so it's still, it's there, and we, st we have community property in California. Uh, other states don't, and so it still makes a difference, uh, again, particularly yes. in, the, in the separate reporting context. Yes. Okay, now, when we are dealing with uh, married couples or registered domestic partners, what happens related well, to this? Yes, there are a number of interesting issues under California law because registered domestic partners uh, are recognized the same as spouses under, under California law. That is, they're subject to the community property regime. 
So in California, same-sex couples have community property, mm -hmm. uh, but they don't. Uh, are, they wouldn't be allowed to file a joint return at the federal level. Right. So if you were going to report income consistently with the rules of Poe versus Seaborn, you should report 50% of the community income by one partner and 50% by the other partner. Right. Um, and unfortunately, I actually worked with a California attorney to try to get the IRS to give us a statement that that is exactly how community income would be taxed for registered domestic partners. Uh, they've never issued, the IRS has never issued a public statement. They issued an internal memorandum called a Chief Counsel Advisory that says very narrowly that registered domestic partners, this was before marriage was possible, so registered yeah. domestic partners in California cannot apply the rule of Poe versus Seaborn to the earned income of one of the partners if the earnings are from personal service income. Yes. Uh, it doesn't say anything else. It doesn't say whether it's going to... I don't see how it could refuse to recognize the community property since they, the, the state does create those rights, but they ruled that they would not uh, allow okay. them to split earned income. So again, this is a chief counsel advice. Uh, the problem again is, is, first of all, it's sort of an informal communication in some ways. Uh, right. It's not, you, it's you, not like not, a, you can't even cite it as authority. Yeah, it's not authority. It's not a revenue ruling. Right. It's not a regulation. Right. This is just sort of like, uh, again, it's sort of an informal piece of advice that was put out, but it's the only thing that's out there. Right now, it's the only thing that's and, out there. And that's the frustrating uh, part of all this because as tax practitioners, uh, people who are preparing income tax returns, you know, I mean, you sort of hang your hat on whatever guidance that you can get, certainly though it's not necessarily in the favor of your client. Well, it depends. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, some clients would prefer to split income. Yes. Uh, but some clients would prefer not to because yes. if you have a low income taxpayer mm -hmm. uh, who's now suddenly going to become a higher income taxpayer because 50% of the community income is going to be allocated to her, she might lose some benefit of things like the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit. Uh, beneficial provisions in the Internal Revenue Code that are dependent on the amount of income you have. Yeah. But again, we don't have a consistency here right. on, on how we're well, treating and people. And some, some people wonder if, if, I'm ta if I'm taxed on all of my earnings, but we pay our deductible, if my partner and I pay our deductible expen expenditures out of community income, do we split the expenses even though I reported all the income? because we are the two people who own the pr money that's being used to pay those expenses, or should I be entitled to the deduction since I had to pay all the income? Right. It's, it's kind a mess. Of, kind it's of a mess. Nuts. Uh, by the way, folks, um, just to let you know, California has issued some guidance uh, to try to help people with this because we have totally different reporting. So this is a, a Franchise Tax Board Publication 776. It's actually a pretty good uh, guide. And Actually, the Franchise Tax Board has been wonderful on this issue. Yeah. The minute uh, that uh, the legislation in California uh, required registered domestic partners to file jointly, which they can't do at the federal level, but must do at the state level, the Franchise Tax Board immediately put together work groups and tried to get uh, as much clarification as possible. Because what happens now is you report one way for federal tax yes. purposes, you report as single individuals yes. if you're a couple, even if you're married. You report jointly if you uh, are reporting to the state, but the joint state return is based on a federal joint return. So you actually have to do a mock federal joint return before you can do your California returns. So you've got two returns at the federal level, and even though you're only required to file one at the state level, you have to do an extra return to figure out what the amount is at the state level. So yeah. it's, it's an added burden to same-sex yeah. couples. So it's almost like the, the, we know there's going to be a 25% increase in, in the uh, tax return preparation fee. For <laughs> well, I hope it's not quite 25%. <laughs> it's all the same information, but, the there same is, but there certainly is a slight yeah. increase. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's look at a few um, uh, transactions, transfers, whatever uh, situations. So first of all, uh, now we've got a, again, a married couple that are same sex or uh, registered domestic right. partners. Uh, what if you agree to share income with your partner in that sort of a situation? 